This week, we continue in the second part of a reading of Manly P. Hall's The Occult Anatomy of Man. We're talking about the three worlds, heaven, earth, and hell, and the analogous human anatomy that goes along with them, the pineal gland, the pituitary, the thalamus, all have their respective parts in this idea of an occulted anatomy. Stay tuned for part two. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back to the show. This is episode number 598. I want to thank all of the contributors, fellows, producers, and legacy partners of the WCY podcast. Thank you guys for all of your assistance in producing this show. And if you're curious on how you can assist the WCY podcast, the Whence Came You podcast, head on over to WCYpodcast.com and check out the various options. We've also got a shop and a bookstore for those interested. Upcoming presentations. On the 23rd of June, I will be doing the Masonic Pub Crawl, Freemasonry in America and its Colonial Tavern Beginnings. I'll be doing that for Battle Creek, Michigan at a festive board that is happening. Tickets can be found at their event. I'll put a link to that in the show notes in case you find yourself up there. And then uh, just a couple days later on the 25th, I'll be doing Freemasonry, a history of mystery for a St. John's Day festive board happening at Manassa Lodge, number 182 in Manassa, Virginia. So let's go ahead and get right into the education this week. We had started last week an episode of a series on the podcast. Last week was part one of the occult anatomy of man, a sort of pamphlet slash brochure slash miniature book that was produced by Manly P. Hall. And last week, again, we read part one. So if you want to listen to part one, that's going to be episode number 597. This is going to be part two of the occult anatomy of man, titled The Three Worlds. According to the mystery schools, the human body is divided into three major parts. And in analogy with this, the universe without is said to be composed of three worlds, heaven, earth, and hell. Heaven is the superior world, and for some unknown reason is supposed to be above, although Ingersoll proved conclusively that owing to the rotation of the earth, up and down are always changing places. Nearly all religions teach that God dwells in the heavens. Their members are taught to believe that God is above them. So they raise their hands in prayer and lift their eyes to the heavens when they implore or petition him. Among some nations, he is supposed to dwell on the tops of mountains, which are the highest places of the world. Wherever he is and whatever he is, his place of domicile is above, overshadowing the world below. Between heaven above and hell beneath, is the earth, which the Scandinavians called Midgard, or the Middle Garden. It is suspended in space and forms the dwelling place of men and other living creatures. It is connected to the heavens by a rainbow bridge down which the gods descend. Its volcanic craters and fissures are said to connect it with hell, the land of darkness and oblivion. Here, twixt heaven and earth dominion wielding, as Goethe said, exists nature. The green grass, the flowing rivers, the mighty ocean exist only in the middle world, which is a sort of neutral ground where the hosts of good and evil fight their eternal battle of Armageddon. Below in darkness and flames, torment and suffering is the world of hell, which we have interpreted as hell with two L's instead of one. It is the great beneath, for as surely as we think of heaven as up, we think of hell as down. While this middle place, earth, seems to be the dividing line between them. In hell are the forces of evil, the tearing, rendering, destroying powers, which are always bringing sorrow to the earth, which struggle untiringly to overthrow the throne of the gods in heaven. The entire system is an anatomical myth for the heaven world of the ancients. The domed temple on the top of the mountain was the skull with its divine contents, This is the home of the gods and man. It is termed up because it occupies the northern end of the human spine, the temple of the gods, 
who rule the earth is said to be at the North Pole, which also, by the way, is the home of Santa Claus. Because the North Pole represents the positive end of the spinal column and the planetary lord. Santa Claus coming down the chimney with his sprig of evergreen, the Christmas tree, at the season of the year when nature is dead, has a fine Masonic interpretation for those who wish to study it. The same is true of the manna that descended to feed the children of Israel in the wilderness. For this manna is a substance which comes down the spinal cord from the brain. The Hindus symbolized the spine as the stem of the sacred lotus. Therefore the skull and contents are symbolized by the flower. The spinal column is Jacob's ladder, connecting heaven and earth, while its 33 segments are the degrees of masonry and the number of years of the life of Christ. Up these segments, the candidate ascends in consciousness to reach the Temple of Initiation, located on top of the mountain. It is in this domed room with a hole in the floor, the foramen magnum, that the great mystery initiations are given. The Himalaya mountains rise above earth, representing the shoulders and the upper half of the body. They are the highest mountains in the world. Somewhere, upon their summit, stands the temple resting like the heavens of the Greeks upon the shoulders of Atlas. It is interesting to note that the Atlas is the upper vertebra of the human spine upon which the condyles of the skull rest. In the brain there are a number of caves, ventricles and folds, and in them, according to Eastern legends, live the wise men, the yogis and hermits. The caves of the yogis are said to be located at the head of the Ganges River. Every religion has its sacred river. To the Christians, it is the Jordan to the Egyptians, the Nile, while to the Hindus, the Ganges. The sacred river is the spinal canal, which has its source among the peaks of the mountains. The holy men in their retreats represent the spiritual sight in the human brain and are the seven sleepers of the Quran, who must remain in darkness of their caves until the spirit revitalizes them. The brain is the upper room referred to in the Gospels where Jesus met with his disciples. And it is said that the disciples themselves represent twelve convolutions of the brain. It is these twelve convolutions which later send their messages by means of the nerves into the body below to convert the Gentiles, or preach the gospel in the Middle Earth. These twelve convolutions gather around the central opening of the brain, the third ventricle, which is the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat, where between the spreading wings of the angels Jehovah talks with the high priest, and where both day and night the Shekinah's glory hovers. From this point, also, the spirit finally ascends from Golgotha, the place in the skull. It is a clairvoyant fact that the spirit not only leaves, but also enters the body through the crown of the head, probably giving rise to the story of Santa Claus and his chimney. The Trinity in man lives in the three great chambers of the human body, from which they radiate their power throughout the three worlds. These centers are the brain, the heart, and the reproductive system. These are the three main chambers of the pyramid and also the rooms in which are given the entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason's degrees of Blue Lodge Masonry. In the three chambers dwell the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, who are symbolized by the three-lettered word AUM, A-U-M. The transmutation, regeneration, and unfoldment of these three great centers results in the sounding of the lost word which is the great secret of the Masonic Order. From the spinal nerves come impulses and life forces which make this possible. Therefore, the Mason is told to consider carefully his substitute word, which means In the cerebellum, or posterior brain, which has charge of the motive system of the human body and is the only brain developed in the animal, is to be found a little tree-like growth, which has long been symbolized by the sprig of acacia and as such referred to in the Masonic allegory. The two lobes of the cerebrum were called by the ancients Cain and Abel, and have much to do with the legend of the curse of Cain, which is literally the curse of unbalance. For the murder of the spirit of equilibrium, Cain is sent forth a wanderer upon the face of the earth. I have in my possession a very remarkable skull which originally rested on the shoulders of a homicide. It is of high organic quality, but bears the curse of Cain. This individual had a grudge which he nursed very carefully. Nursed grudges sometimes become very dangerous things. This person swore 
that when he met a certain man he would cut his heart out and throw it in his face. A number of years passed, his hatred grew, and at last meeting his enemy he attacked him and fulfilled his threat. He was hanged for the crime, but the skull bearing the testimony to the brain reveals a very interesting fact. The right half of the brain is under the control of Mercury, the planet of intelligence, and as a result of the crossing of the brain nerves at the base of the skull, it rules the left side of the body. The left half of the brain, under the control of Mars, the spirit of anger and impulse, rules the right side of the body, and likewise the strong right arm. As the result of his hatred, and the rulership of Mars which grew out of that hatred, the left rear side of the brain is fully twice the size of the right. The individual allowed Mars to control his nature. The impetuosity of Mars ruled him, and he paid with his life for the mark of Cain. Science knows there is a very narrow line between genius and insanity. For any dominating vice or virtue, man must pay with unbalance. Unbalance always distorts the viewpoint, and distorted viewpoints are unfailingly productive of misery. In the skull is the switchboard which controls the activities of the body. Every function of man below the neck is controlled by a center of consciousness in the brain. Proof of this is the fact that injury to certain centers of the brain results in paralysis of various parts of the body. Medical science now knows that the spinal cord is an elongation of the brain, and some authorities even claim the cord to be capable of intelligence throughout its entire length. This cord is the flaming sword which is supposed to have stood at the gates of the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is in the skull, within which is a tree bearing twelve manner of fruit. The brain is filled with vaulted chambers and passageways, which have their correspondence in the spans and arches of the temples, while the third ventricle is undoubtedly the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. The spinal cord is the serpent of the ancients. In Central and South America, the savior god is called Quetzalcoatl. His name means a feathered serpent, and this has always been his symbol. This is the brazen serpent raised by Moses in the wilderness. The nine rattles on the tail of the serpent are called the number of man, and they represent the sacral and coccygeal bones within whose centers the secret of the human evolution is contained. Every organ of the physical body is reproduced in the brain, where it can be traced by the law of analogy. There are two embryonic human forms, one male and the other female, twisted together in the brain. These are the yin and yang of China the black and white dragons biting each other. One of these figures has as its organ of expression the pineal gland, and the other the pituitary body. These two ductless glands are well worth consideration, for they are very important factors in the unfolding of human consciousness. It is known that these glands are larger and more active in higher grades of mentality than in those of lower quality, and in certain congenital idiots they are very small. These two little glands are called the head and the tail of the Dragon of Wisdom. They are the copper and zinc poles of an electric circuit which has the entire body as a battery. The pituitary body, which rests in the cella trisica of the sphenoid bone, directly behind and just a little below the bridge of the nose, and connected to the third ventricle by a tiny tube called infundibulum, is the feminine pole or negative center which has charge of the expressions of physical energy. Its activity also regulates to a large degree the size and weight of the body. It is also a thermometer revealing disorder in any other of the chain of ductless glands. Endocrinology, the study of the ductless glands and their secretions, is still in its experimental stage, but someday it will be revealed as the most important of all medical sciences. The pituitary body, is known under the following symbols by the ancient world. The alchemical retort, the mouth of the dragon, the Virgin Mary, the Holy Grail, the lunar crescent, the laver of purification, one of the cherubim of the Ark, the Isis of Egypt, the Radha of India, and the fish's mouth. It may well be called the hope of glory of the physical man. At the opposite end of the third ventricle, and a little higher, is the pineal gland which looks not unlike a pine cone, from which it secured its name. Sir Ernest Alfred Wallace Budge, 
keeper of the Egyptian antiquities in the British Museum mentions in one of his works the Egyptian custom of tying pine cones on the tops of their heads. He states that in the papyrus rolls, these cones are fastened to the tops of the heads of the dead when taken into the presence of Osiris, Lord of the Underworld. Undoubtedly, this symbol referred to the pineal gland. It was also the custom of certain African tribes to fasten pieces of fat to the tops of their heads and allow them to melt in the sun and run down over them as part of their religious observances. It is interesting that the American Indian should wear his feather, which was originally symbolical of spiritual perception, in the same place where the Christian monk shaves his head. The Hindus teach that the pineal gland is the third eye, called the Eye of Dengma. It is called by the Buddhists the All-Seeing Eye, and is spoken of in Christianity as the Eye Single. We are told that ages ago the pineal gland was an organ of sense orientation by which man cognizized the spiritual world, but that with the coming of the material senses and the two objective eyes, it ceased to be used, and during the time of the Lemurian race retreated to its present position in the brain. It is said that children recapitulating their previous periods of evolution have a limited use of the third eye up to their seventh year, at which the time the skull bones grow together. This accounts for the semi-clairvoyant condition of children who are far more sensitive than adults along psychic lines. The pineal gland is supposed to secrete an oil, which is called resin, the life of the pine tree. This word is said to be involved in the origin of the Rosicrucians, who were working with the secretions of the pineal gland and seeking to open the eye single. For it is said in scripture, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be filled with light. The pineal gland is the tail of the dragon and has a tiny finger-like protuberance at one end. This gland is called Joseph, for it is the father of the God-man. The finger-like protuberance is called the Staff of God, sometimes the Holy Spear. Its shape is like the evaporating vessel of the alchemists. It is a spiritual organ which is later destined to be what it once was, namely, a connecting link between the human and the divine. The vibrating finger on the end of this gland is the rod of Jesse and the scepter of the high priest. Certain exercises as given in the Eastern and Western mystery schools cause this little finger to vibrate, resulting in a buzzing, droning sound in the brain. This is sometimes very distressing, especially when the individual who experiences the phenomenon, in all too many cases, knows nothing about the experience through which he is passing. In the middle of the brain and surrounded by the convolutions is the third ventricle, a vaulted chamber of initiation. Around it sit three kings, three great centers of life and power, the pituitary body, the pineal gland, and the optic thalamus. In this chamber also is a small gritty seed which is undoubtedly connected with the king's coffer in the Great Pyramid. The third ventricle is supposed to be the seat of the soul, and the aura radiating from the heads of saints and sages is said to represent the golden glow pouring from this third ventricle. Between the eyes and just above the root of the nose is a spreading in the frontal bone of the skull, which is called the frontal sinus. The slight bulge caused by the spreading of the bone is known to phrenology as the seat of individuality. It is here that the jewels are placed on the forehead of the Buddhas, and it is also from this point that the serpent rose from the crown of the ancient Egyptians. Several of the mystery schools teach that this is the seat of Jehovah in the human body. While his function is through the generative system, his center of consciousness, as a part of the spirit of man, is supposed to be located in a sea of blue ether called the Veil of Isis, in the center of the frontal sinus. When clairvoyantly studying the body of man, that little point always shows up as a black dot and cannot be analyzed. The Palatine Hill of the Ancients, upon which were built the temples of Jupiter and Juno, also has its place in the human body. The palate bone is a sort of hill-shaped structure, and right above it are the orbital cavities containing the two eyes, which are the Jupiter and Juno of the ancient world. The cross, of course, represents the human body, 
the upper limb of the head of man rising above the horizontal line of his outstretched arms. As already stated, the great churches and cathedrals of the world have been built in the form of a cross, and contain where the head should be the altar upon which are burning lighted candles. These candles are symbolic of spiritual sense centers in the brain, while the custom of placing a rose window over the altar suggests the soft place at the top of the skull. The skull, the upper room, is the sanctum sanctorum of the Masonic Temple, and to it only the pure can aspire. The winged bone, which medical science knows as the sphenoid, is the Egyptian scarab carrying in its claws the pituitary body, and also bearing aloft the gleaming spark of immortality located in the frontal sinus. We are told in the ancient mythologies that the gods came down from heaven and walked with men, instructing them in the arts and sciences. In a similar way, the godlike powers in man descended from the heaven world of his brain to carry on the work of, the, of constructing and reconstructing natural substances. We are told that in the ultimate evolution of man's body will slowly be dissolved back again into the brain, which was its origin, until nothing remains but seven globular centers radiating seven perfect sense perceptions, which are the spirits before the throne and the saviors which he is bringing into the world to redeem it through the seven periods of his growth. Man is an inverted plant, gaining his nourishment from the sun as the plant does from the earth. As the life of the plant ascends in the stem to nourish its leaves and branches, so the life of man rooted in the brain descends to produce the same result. This life descending is symbolized as the world saviors who come down into the world to die for men. Later these lives are returned again to the brain, where they glorify man before all the worlds of creation. So much for the story of the brain. Now let us consider the next of man's marvelous parts, namely the spinal column. That is the end of part two. This particular part of the text is interesting as it contains so much analogy. Something that it was interesting, right, is this idea of the Santa Claus and the chimney. Some of you might have like raised an eyebrow at this, or maybe others might have actually thought, hey, wait a minute, that sounds kind of familiar. And if it does, it's because we had a Christmas special a while back in which I read a chapter from God, Man, the Word Made Flesh, which was by George W. Perry uh, and Ines Adora Perry, that was originally published in 1920 uh, by the Chemistry of Life Company in Los Angeles, California. In it, on page 107, is a chapter that we read called The Mystery of Santa Claus Revealed, in which this entire story is uh, portrayed. I don't really buy into it. I think it's interesting symbolism that somebody that that anybody can attribute to anything. However, this particular chapter in the text, part two, the three worlds, is typical of Manly P. Hall. He kind of weaves in and out, not really returning very much to the title of his chapter, meaning he talks about the three worlds, which are supposed to be heaven, earth, and hell, and he rarely returns to that ideology within the text of the chapter. There's a lot going on in regard to the different glands, like pituitary and pineal, that he talks about, that many other popular writers, even today, talk about. However, I will say that most of the content on YouTube that talk about this kind of thing is nothing really more than rehashing exactly what Manly P. Hall has stated with no other additional research. But that's it for this week, so I want to wish all of you out there, anybody listening, you got kids, happy Father's Day. Next week, we're going to dive into part three, the spinal column, and hopefully we'll also have a new episode of Masonic Mythbusters within the episode as well. I'm going to be doing a lot of traveling, so my editing and things are going to be affected. But uh, thanks, everybody out there, for listening. I want to thank one more time our producers, legacy partners, contributors, and fellows. Thank you to everybody out there who is sharing the program with your lodges and with your friends. And if you've got any questions, make sure you hit me up. Let me know. You can follow me on TikTok if you've got questions about the episodes. Happy to reply to messages there at the Wizard of Arge. 
That's the wizard of A R J with underscores instead of spaces. Uh, there'll be there's a link to that on uh, wcypodcast.com. And once again, thanks for listening. If you're curious on how you can help support the show, head on over to wcypodcast.com slash support the show. Until next week, stay on the level for Whence Came You. I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host brother, Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition. Okay, see. Okay, girl.